I'd like to open by sharing a poem that perhaps you've heard in the past. It's just called The Veteran. And here's how it goes. It's the veteran, not the preacher, who has given us freedom of religion. It's the veteran, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It's the veteran, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom to assemble. It is the veteran, not the lawyer, that has given us the right to a fair trial. The veteran, not the politician, that's given us the right to vote. It is the veteran who salutes the flag, who serves under the flag, who gave his oath to support and defend the constitution of our nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and whose coffin is draped by that flag. It is the veteran with faith in God and country who has given us all our rights. Well, I know that many veterans felt betrayed by their fellow citizens this week as the result of the recent elections revealed that the nation was drifting away from the freedoms that they had fought for in the past. Religion has been increasingly under attack in modern times. A recent article in Newsweek stated the following. Let me make sure I got that across. This article was in Newsweek. Quote, the number of violent attacks on churches and church gatherings witnessed in recent months is unsettling. Protesters and rioters across the country have decapitated statues of Jesus, desecrated images of the Virgin Mary, and vandalized monuments to a Jesuit priest. Churches in Washington, D.C. and California have been set ablaze as symbols of oppression. Fire, chain, and boot are the tool and trade of a culture laying siege on religious freedom. Using the pandemic as an excuse, elected officials have threatened to permanently shut down synagogues, ban drive-in church services, and forbidden singing and chanting in religious services while decreeing that massive protests with shouting and singing are allowed. Add to these the toxic comments of leading newspapers recklessly blaming churches for the spread of COVID-19. A nation truly committed to religious freedom would, in a time of national crisis, welcome the essentiality of religious exercise, not ban it, end quote. Many veterans have a growing concern about the current media bias threatening the freedom of the press for which they gallantly fought to protect and to preserve. The Los Angeles Times says, there is not any media bias, it's a myth. Well, go figure. While such out and out biases may just be a matter of one's preferences or another's opinion, there is no doubt that there is a certain bias in reporting to favor corporate owners and mainstream biases, a tendency of the media to focus on certain hot topics, hot stories, and ignore news of more substance. One commentary on the subject headlined, political bias in media doesn't really threaten democracy. While veterans are on all sides of the political spectrum these days, there are certain liberties, certain rights and freedoms which they fought to preserve and they see shrinking before their very eyes. The United States veteran fought for the freedom of speech, not for free speech zones. Let me give you an example of a free speech zone. Just exactly what is that? Well, why? 
while taxpayer-funded colleges and universities routinely bring in their choice of speakers for a general assembly meeting, they limit freedom of speech to certain parts, the campus only. Colleges and universities maintain policies that limit student and faculty demonstrations and other expressions of activity to small and or out-of-the-way areas on their campus. Called a free speech zone. The idea of a free speech zone, well, that just might sound appealing in theory, but in practice, these zones function more like free speech quarantines, banishing speakers to outposts that might be tiny or on the fringe of the campus, generally both. Worse still, students who wish to use free speech zones often have to comply with onus requirements or requirements. For example, they may have to register an event with the administration weeks in advance or adhere to a strict time limit or to find an approval from the administration to express their activity. And by Treating campus expression as something to be hidden, regulated, and monitored instead of encouraged and celebrated. That is not the freedom of speech that these veterans risk their lives to protect. Remember that line in the poem? It's the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to assemble. Well, that freedom to assemble is quickly eroding also. Not to sound too much like a conspiracy theorist, but here it goes anyway. Today you can easily be tracked. Many of you leave your own trail on social media. There are drones out there more and more frequently, especially in the larger urban areas. They're equipped with cameras that can read your license plate from miles away. Cameras on major routes, tracking devices on your phones and your, well, the newer smartwatches. It is possible for the government to know where a person is and who they are meeting with. By the way, since we are currently going through the book of Revelation on a weekly basis, I want you to keep in mind what we're just now recording or saying here. And if you don't think that the Antichrist is going to use every single one of these to control the country, to control the world, to control people, you've got another thing coming. It's the veteran, not the politician, it said, who has given us the right to vote. The soldier has fought for some, died so that you and I can have the right to vote today. But to give that same freedom to other citizens as well in other nations. Some have given the ultimate prize so that another person in another country can have the right to do what you and I do today here, and that's to vote. Just as he fought to give the Afghan the right to vote in his own country, he fought to preserve that same right for the U.S. citizen and is bewildered of reports or accusations of voter fraud in his or her own country. It's the veteran who salutes the flag, who serves under the flag, who gave his oath to support and defend the constitution of our nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And he is expected to stand by and watch someone who has never spent one minute wearing a military uniform take a knee when the national anthem is being played. He's expected to stand motionlessly on the curb and watch someone who never risked his life for this nation to burn old glory in the street in front of him. 
Old vets, like myself, lived in a time when military service was a requirement. It was mandatory. From the ages of 18 to 25, you could be inducted into the military at almost a drop of a hat. Not old enough to drink, not even to vote back then, but old enough to carry a rifle and defend those very rights that we've mentioned today. One after another would later say that their military service made a man out of them. They went in as kids, with few exceptions, and came out as veterans, ready to participate in all the rights that they had bravely fought for in the years prior. But isn't the last line in that poem something, something's askewed. So something was wrong with that. As I took a look at that, I thought, now I'm gonna to have to take exception to that, that last line that was in there. This is what it said. It is the veteran with faith in God and country who gave us all our freedoms. I'd like to correct that. All of those freedoms, while it is definitely true that the veteran fought to preserve them for us, it was God who gave them to us in the first place. Amen. You see, my friend, there is a bigger battle than what you and I might see on the surface. There's a greater threat than what may be perceived in our nation today. There is a battle that is not across the seas somewhere else. It's a spiritual battle that's raging right here, right now, at home. So would you please, if you haven't already, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2 with me. Beginning in verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Let's pray one more time, shall we? Father God in heaven, as we reflect on that last few words, the prayer of the Apostle Paul for young Timothy, we want to apply that to ourselves as well. Give us understanding. As we turn to your word for direction, Enlighten us by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I need you to look back at verses three and four again with me. Would you please do that? While a veteran used to serve in the military, notice past tense, he or she is no longer in active duty. We look back on the glory days and we swap some war stories. We carry scars from those same days, some that you can see, others that are deeply hidden. However, we are not subject to acquiring any more of them, at least not any longer, from those sources. But not so as a Christian. There is no such thing as a veteran while living here on earth. 
We are called to be on active duty. You only become a veteran when you leave this life and enter into eternal life with Jesus Christ. The draft, as we called it, ultimately ended in 1973. But it has been and always will continue to be in the Lord's army. Paul, the author of what we just read, was drafted while he was in pursuit of those who had been drafted into the Lord's army before him. He was in a position of power to punish and persecute Christians. The Lord knocked him to the ground. Paul was blinded by the light of Jesus. And for several days, he must have been terribly terrified and certainly confused by his new circumstances. Ultimately, surrendering to his induction into the Lord's army. As a result, that great warrior gave us 13 books of instruction in the New Testament. A record of his example, his exemplary lifestyle as a Christian given to us in the second half of the book of Acts. And many will also attribute the book of Hebrews to this same soldier. We see a bit later in this same letter to Timothy where Paul realizes that he is on the verge of leaving active duty and heading into his heavenly home where he can finally become a veteran. Turn the pages of your Bible, please, to chapter 4. I'd like to read with you verses 6, 7, and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So what advice does Sergeant Major Paul give to the rest of us who are enlisted troops? Verse 3 again says, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you right here and now, are you willing to endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ? I hope you are because, well, you must. It's inevitable in reality. That's what Paul is saying. It's bound to happen. And it's bound to happen more than just once. Being a Christian is an uphill battle. It's hard. The North Vietnamese captured the venerated capital city of Hu during the Tet Offensive, a coordinated series of attacks on over 100 American and South Vietnamese positions countrywide. The battle to regain Hu began in February 1968, and it lasted for nearly the entire month. As Marines ferociously drove North Vietnamese and Communist uh, Viet Cong forces from the city, the Perfume River divided the city of Hu into two parts. To the north was the Citadel, a three-square-mile fortress surrounded by walls 30 feet high and up to 40 feet thick, with a moat on three sides and the Perfume River on the fourth. To the south, the smaller and more modern section of who was connected to the citadel by a bridge. U.S. Marines and Army soldiers were tasked with clearing out the entrenched enemy in the southern portion, portion of the city, while the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the Arvin, would clear out the northern portion of the citadel. Untrained, for urban combat, U.S. battalions 
had to come up with tactics and techniques on the fly. While facing a brutal enemy, the process caused heavy casualties. They went from house to house, room to room, merely to gain a little bit more ground. Speed, surprise, and shock were essential to achieving this strategy of victory. After clearing the south side, U.S. battalions broke into the citadel from the bridge to assist the Arvin troops in the north. Finally, on February 24th, the South Vietnamese flag flew over the citadel on March 2nd, the longest sustained infantry battle of that war had been to that point was officially declared over. It was victory. Are you ready to defend the gospel of the Lord and the kingdom of God like that? That's what we've been called to do. That's who we are in the Lord's army. And the reason that I ask is because that's what Sergeant Major Paul said to Lance Corporal Timothy. Timothy, this is what you need to do. He not only decreed that to Lance Corporal Timothy, but to each and every one of us today. I'm a veteran of the United States military, but I'm also on active duty in the Lord's Army. And so are you. And this is the hill that we must take. And once we take it, we must continue to defend it with our very lives. It's more important than the United States flag. It's more important than our national anthem. Look again at verse 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. A soldier, a sailor, an airman, a marine. We may have some ties to this life, but they cannot allow themselves to become entangled in them because that entanglement can become a deathly snare. First and foremost, he's a military man and he must keep that priority clear in his mind and his heart. His life might depend upon it someday. There's only one recruiter, the one who enlisted you. That one is Jesus. More than a chief of staff, more than a commandant, more than the chief of naval operations, Jesus is Lord and King, and he is the recruiter. Can you imagine the chief of staff recruiting? Can you imagine the chief of naval operations recruiting? But the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings personally recruited you into his service, into his army. Paul's induction into the Lord's army was certainly arresting. It seems so spectacular, but yours is nonetheless miraculous. You may not write 13 books, but you are needed to take this hill. Don't get caught up in the things of this life, no matter what they may be. Politics, pleasures, goals, and aspirations. Those things can be entertained in your mind, but they cannot become first and foremost. We've all heard of the KISS method, right? Just keep it simple kind of a thing. Well, Jesus explained what that was and how to do it. It's written in Matthew's gospel. 
Chapter six, verse 33, here's what it says. Seek ye first. First things first. Don't let anything else take priority over what I'm about to say. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You can get caught up in all those other things and they can cause you to fret and get sidetracked, cause you to come back and want to rally once again for the something that you thought was the major cause when all along, a highest priority for the soldier in the Lord's army is the kingdom of God. We refer to ourselves oftentimes as ambassadors for that kingdom. This morning, I'm here to remind you that not only are you an ambassador to represent Jesus Christ and his kingdom, but you're a soldier. Soldiers fight. They roll up their sleeves. They get involved. And sometimes it's messy. That's what we're called to do. And the reason is, as we've said so many times before, is because each and every one of us know someone who if they passed away today, for some reason, known or unknown, expected or unexpected, they would not enter into that kingdom. That's the battle that you have today. That's the gospel that needs to be passed on to our community and those around about us. Don't get caught up in the things of this life. You're still on active duty. But when the day comes, when you pass from here into eternity, when you become a veteran, then you'll be able to enjoy the things that you fought for, the things that you lived for, spiritually speaking, the spiritual principles that you defended. There is laid up for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give you on that day, and not to you only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Today, today, you're living, breathing here. Here amongst us or here at home. And that means you're still on active duty. Someday, I'm gonna step across the threshold of this life into eternity. I'll become a veteran then. I'll have been a veteran of the United States military and I'll have been a veteran of the Lord's army. But not until that day shall any of us rest. We must take the hill. And once we take it, we must defend it. We had confidence in those that were above us and that the instructions that they were giving us meant that we would sooner or later gain that victory. And as we've read through the commander-in-chief's book, we see that Jesus Christ has already won that victory. We're just there in the pursuit of making it known to all of our family, to all of our friends, to all of our neighbors, to all those in our community. Once again, that's the hill. You can do this. God's called you to. Father, we come before you this morning.